Chicago's murder rate soared 72% in 2016, shootings up more than 88% in the first three months of 2016 compared with the same period last year according to the data released by the Chicago Police Department. Police say the disturbing rise in violence is driven by gangs. The city has seen 141 murders as of April 2016 compared to 82 murders at the same point last year. Mayor Rahm Emanuel appointed Eddie Johnson as his new intern superintendent and hopes that he can help stem the violence. Johnson replaced John Escalade who took over the department in December 2015 after Emanuel fired Superintendent Gary McCarthy. McCarthy was ousted in the aftermath of the court order release of the dash cam video that showed a white police officer fatally shooting a black teen 16 times. The video Laquan McDonald sparked weeks of protest in the city. Some of those groups to lead the protests are the Violence Interrupters, led by T.O. Hardeman, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, led by Greg Greer, New Era Chicago, and Black Lives Matter Chicago. It was three months into 2016 and Chicago is reaching new heights of violence. According to the Chicago Tribune, as of this past Wednesday, there have been at least 135 homicides recorded so far this year. That's a 71% jump compared to this time last year. It's the worst first quarter of a year since 1999. According to the Tribune, shootings have jumped as well with at least 727 people shot since the beginning of the year. Just yesterday, one headline from NBC Chicago read H shot two fatally in less than one hour. Al, uh, you, you've been out there a good deal, and I'll ask you the same question oh. Al, I asked you a year ago. What separates yeah. Chicago from New York City and other cities that have seen crime actually level off or go down? I think that part of it in Chicago has been that there's such a breakdown in terms of how the communities are, are now so separate. And there's no organized way of getting your arms around dealing with the proliferation of guns. But I think that what is really frightening is like it's the new norm. I mean, nobody has fought police reform like I have, but why are we not also, as, as I've been out there and others, getting the media and all up in arms about this? It's almost like, yeah, eight people shot, so what? Yeah. And it is a so what? And the presidential candidates ought to be debating this and, and arguing about it. So, so what's the answer for the policing in Chicago? Do they actually need to... Community, they've got to work in the community. The police cannot be seen as the enemies or the, or the imposed people. Is it that much worse in Chicago than it is, say, in New York and other I think it is. cities? I why, think why? it is. I think because you've had a culture in Chicago where the police seem so removed and so disconnected, and then the uh, McDonald case made them appear so dishonest. Now, murders jumped to more than 50. That's from less than 30 in January of last year. Now, police say the surge in gun violence is being fueled by gang conflicts and retaliatory violence. Retaliation was directly related to DeAndre Holliday's death. He was shot dead on New Year's Day after fighting with another man. first I was sitting at home um, watching TV I guess something New Year's Eve party or something on TV and um, I heard someone bamming on the door where well, they were ringing a doorbell so my daughter let him in and it was his friend first and his friend's clothes was ripped off of him he was screaming and hollering and he like mama mama they they shot Dre they shot Dre and then all of a sudden these two women come in behind him and they come with their arms extended as to hug me. And I'm like, I've never seen these women before. 
So I'm like, no, my son is in his room. When I went to bed, he was in his room. So I go and open the door and he wasn't there. So the two ladies drove me to the scene and my child was laying on the ground, covered up with a sheet. And I, my daughter and I lost it. We just lost it. I couldn't believe. At first I'm like, That's, that can't be my son. That's somebody else. That's not my kid. But it was. So, you know, we in Chicago in 2016 have had a, a very challenged year. It's just on the road to becoming one of the most dangerous years for homicides in Chicago history, at least in the past 20 years. January, we had 57 homicides. May of 2016, 67 homicides. The most highest is which is 70 in June of this year, 70 homicides in Chicago land alone. And as of year to date, July, we're on, we're on the course for 31 homicides. These numbers are staggering. This is, what, this is why we have to prevent violence. This is why we are out there on the front lines day in and day out because if we don't do something, the numbers will continue going. 20 years on a 20 year high and we're equaling that maybe even to surpass that, it's, it's gotta stop. I'm gonna tell you all something that's gonna be disturbing to you. When I told you the statistics about the guns that we recovered, more than New York and LA combined, right? Do you realize since January 1st of this year, the Chicago police has recovered one gun of every hour of this year? That's ridiculous. But there's reason for hope. I have been talking with our elected officials and our judicial partners to come up with some teeth to holding these individuals accountable. And we're getting there. We're getting there. So just keep praying for us. We will get there. We don't want to get the people that, that make a mistake. We want to get the guys that are out here repeat gun offenders killing our people out in the street. That's what we want to get. So my pledge to you is this. I will do everything in my power to ensure CPD is better when I leave than it was when I got here. Around 3.30 in the afternoon, about four blocks away, a man walked into Nad Nadia Fish and Chicken on 75th Street and began shooting. Two men were found dead inside, two others outside, among them two brothers who were visiting their mother at work. All right, so I, as I, I work at this store here and I was off the day that that did happen, it's like sad because the area is always bad. It's always bad violence going on. Stuff like this is always going on. But one of the co-workers, see somebody shoot now.
like this every day. Every day. Every day. It's stuff like this going on every day. And with the shooting death of a young Chicago mother. Africa Bass has two children, and today was her son's birthday. She'd been walking with her aunt just after midnight in the 8700 block of South Burley when a gunman in a black SUV suddenly opened fire. Eyewitness News reporter Evelyn Holmes joins us live on the city's south side with more details. Evelyn. Well, Chicago police have had very little to say about their ongoing investigation into the shooting that claimed the life of that mother of two, 23-year-old Africa Bass, and left this community in shock. woman's life you took a niece you took a friend you took a you took you, you took a mother you took a daughter you hurt a community when you shot that girl down you hurt a community how do you feel one day your mother would feel the same way we feel today and I pray for you I pray for all of you this got to change it could be your daughter your niece, That's your one team, it could be anybody. It ain't it, it hurts us more because these babies don't have their mother on this birthday. How you feel today? Well, the shootings and homicides will not stop in Chicago because the police cannot stop killings in the African-American community. And I say African-American because over 85 percent of the homicides do take place in the African-American community. It's hard to stop a killing and you don't know it's about to occur. This is not really a big time criticism of the police, but the police are in response mode, along with a, a lot of these organizations out here. Everybody comes after the fact. The only way you're going to stop a killing, you must have a relationship with the potential killer where that person will listen to you at that moment in time in his or her life. And you have, you need the ability rather to intercept whispers on the ground level so you can intervene before somebody pulls a trigger. And that's what violence interrupters, uh, that's what they do on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, my staff in the year 2016, we've mediated around 40 conflicts that could have turned deadly on the front end because we know the people. We have relationships with a lot of these high risk individuals, uh, if you want to call it that. But I look at these as our young brothers and sisters out here and we know how to talk sense because my staff are trained. They go through a 40 hour training and the violence interrupters is like a public health model. No more shooting! 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 The rise of welfare in the 1960s contributed greatly to the demise of the black family. The out of wedlock birth rate among African Americans today is 73%. That's seven times higher than it was prior to welfare. Before welfare in the late 1950s, only 9% of black families with children were headed by a single mother. Black women were more likely to be married than white women. Even throughout the harsh environment of slavery and into the early decades of the 20th century, most black children grew up in two-parent households. It wasn't until welfare in the mid-1960s that the black family break down. When President Lyndon Johnson in 1964 launched the so-called war on poverty, he explained that his objective was to reduce dependency, break the cycle of poverty, and make taxpayers out of tax eaters. 
Johnson further claimed that his program would bring an end to the conditions that breed despair and violence. Despite knowing welfare was destroying the black family, welfare expanded dramatically after Lyndon Johnson. Between the mid-1960s and the mid-70s, the dollar value of public housing quadrupled and the amount spent on food stamps rose more than tenfold. By 1974, such benefits were at an astounding 20 times higher than they had been in 1965. By 1977, the number of people receiving public assistance had more than doubled since 1960. The most devastating effect of welfare was the effect it had on American family life, particularly in the black community. As provisions in welfare laws offered ever-increasing economic incentives for shunning marriage and avoid the formation of two parent families, single mother rates rose dramatically. As George Mason University Walter E. Williams puts it, the welfare state has done to black Americans what slavery couldn't do, what Jim Crow couldn't do, what the harshest racism couldn't do, and that is to destroy the black family. Hello, my name is Isaac Ogumbemi. I'm originally from Nigeria, West Africa, and I came into the United States in 1987. Okay, tell me about the family structure in Nigeria. The family structure in Nigeria is basically consists of the mother and the father. And we have what is called the extended family, which includes my parents, my brothers and sisters, and, uh, you know, we all live together harmoniously with, uh, you know, with, 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 with each other. And we have a lot of respect for each other. Um, what do you think the breakdown... Um, the issues are in Chicago on what's going on in America and the African American community. Well, the way I see it, the breakdown of the of the of the family structure in in in, in African American community in, in in America is basically what is causing the problem that we have with our youth today. Uh, the way I see it, it takes a village to raise a kid, and. What I've experienced so far and what I've seen so far here since I've been in the United States is that we have so many single family uh, uh, parents, uh, a, a single woman raising kids, and the father, the father who's supposed to be the figurehead is not around. And that is basically one of the major problems of the breakdown of the social uh, economy problem that the African American are confronted with here in America. Okay, why do you think that? How do we get to having a... What do you think about welfare and rewarding single-family fam, single households? Well, welfare structure here, it's, uh, it's not beneficial. The, way, the reason why I say that is that uh, uh, welfare system is created in such a way that uh, the single family depend on that, on that single... On, 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 that, on that checks and... And the, and, the, and, the, and the reimbursement they're getting from the government, rather than encouraging them to, you know, encouraging them to go and get a job and, and have a, a, you know, and, and, and work hard for their, for their income. Uh, the, reason where, the reason why I said the welfare system is not good is, is because that the, the system is, 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 is created in such a way that the single parents now depend on that welfare check and kind of that kind of give them uh, an opportunity to just go ahead and multiply and just keep having babies, having babies without a father figure head. And that is, that is not good for the, for the, for the, for the African-American society here in America.
got to be about this change. How many children have to die before we come out these houses and decide we're going to change this shit? The well-being of the black community cannot start with the police. It has to start with the people. Power, the ability to respond, the ability to protect and provide for, the ability to deliver a consequence. That's the only thing the black community needs to be concerned with. We got to save ourselves. Stop looking for somebody else to come help you. The mayor cannot save you. Your argument can't save you. Your black president who's on his way out cannot save you. You got to get it in your mind that you're going to come save yourself. How y'all feel? How? How y'all feel? How? How y'all feel? How? How y'all feel? How? One man. One man. One man. One man. One man. Ronnie Man, a member of New Era Chicago, we're a pro-black organization whose mission is to get black people to reunite in an effort to empower the communities that we live in. One of our missions as uh, New Era Chicago, what we do is uh, we go about each community in the city of Chicago, wherever black people are. We go by um, demonstrating love, unity, and black empowerment. How do we do it? We knock on the doors, we give our resources, we give our hugs, we give our love. If you look at all these What's stores, up, King? How you feel? it's gonna be nothing but foreign all stores right in the middle of the neighborhood where we dwell in every day. And they taking all the money out of our neighborhood not putting no money back in the neighborhood. What it is, uh, we out here engaging the community, you know, getting down in the arm aggression community in Chicago. It don't stop. Boots on the ground, out here reaching our people, touching our people, letting our people know that we are here for them, that it's time for us to unite. It's time for us to stop all the nonsense in our community. It's time for us to get together as a people. How you feel, Queen? All right, peace and love. We got to meet our people where they are. It's time out for us to be judging our people. It's time out for us to be sitting up here, sitting on our hands, talking about the problem. In the community, um, that's something that's very important because in all my life, I've never seen uh, any pro-black organization come and knock on my door and show me love and, you know, give me resources and didn't ask me for anything. You know, they hit, they, they, we, we reach out to the community. Also, we, uh, another powerful thing we do is we clean up the neighborhood. We clean up, we pick up all the trash that's in the lawns and in the streets and things like that. We just believe that if you physically clean up, that you will also clean up the mindsets of the masses. You know, uh, it's time that our people need a mental makeover. You know, so uh, cleaning up the community is a way of showing them as opposed to telling them what they need to do. You have to show them as well. So we believe that. Well, I love you, brother. What's the hardest part you, about living in, in this community? Too much shooting. Too much shooting? Right. Okay. Well, who I, whose job is it to make this community better? Uh, us. Uh, I think us. I know. Us who? Us being who? Ourselves. Ourselves. It's on us to keep our children safe. It's on us to employ our children. It's on us to educate our children. Because if we don't get it done, it ain't gonna get done. You just got, you got the whole right mindset. You know what I want you to do? I want you to never forget what you just said. I want you to put some action between your words when it's right. And I want you to spread that to these young brothers and everybody in your, all of your friends and let them understand that it's our job to fix things in our community. You just said something that a lot of adults don't even know, brother. You're a wise young fella to even be able to say that, all right? I'm, I'm giving you the mantle. 
and the charge as a young 11 year old man to go around to your peers. Peer pressure works two ways. Do you know about peer pressure? It works yeah. in the negative. Everybody talks about it negatively, right? But it works positively too. You said what? You can change people's mindset. You can. You got that kind of power. Open your mouth. Talk to your peers and tell them, say, man, we want things to change. Come on, man, let's go clean up our neighborhood. Let's go talk to these guys and say, man, look, we don't need to put these, be shooting and killing each other. You got that kind of power, young brother. You hear me? Believe in yourself. So we go about the community. Um, it's, it's, it, it, then it turns into a uh, black power parade. You know, we go around sing it, saying uh, black power chants, you know, and what those do is they give, they empower the community to see themselves as the great people that we are. Uh, people come out of their houses, people um, hunting in their dead in their tracks, and um, just so they can be a part about it. We gotta understand that there's a generation of people out here who have never uh, heard terms of endearment towards black people. They have never seen black people get together other than to fuss, few and fight, or at funerals. But what we're doing is so powerful and impactful. Little children are looking at us like we're superheroes. I mean, it's something that they have never seen before in their lifetime. The elders are, you know, giving us love and, um, encouraging us and they even throwing up their fists. There's all the violence and things like that going on in the city. Uh, violence is a condition of poverty. So unfortunately, as long as there's poor communities in the city, it's always going to be violence in the city. So that's why we have to go about changing the poverty in our community. We can do those type of things by supporting ourselves economically. Uh, building a strong financial base. Uh, it's, it's economically beneficial to everyone else for black people to destroy themselves. It's economically uh, beneficial for our communities to look the way that they look so people could come in and gentrify them, take what we have and make it so that we can't have access to it anymore. So, um, you know, poverty and crime are, go hand in hand and that's why it's so much crime in our, in our communities because it's so much poverty, man. And until we could change the poverty, we'll never be able to change the crime. So that's what New York Chicago is about. Because those are the gang members. Those are the ones that can't control their kids. So now you're an expert on white No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Not one bit, but I know damn well my little white 18-year-old kid, if I didn't bring him up right, he'd be in trouble too. But I brought my kid up. I didn't let him go run this street. Go home and take care of your kids. Okay, so Nobody I say? Read it. I own guns, not drugs. So who owns drugs? Are you talking about black people own guns? What is the subliminal what message is this? There is no subliminal that message. That you have, that you have so brilliantly displayed on the cross. Hey, I'm T.O. Hardiman, president of Violence and Brothers, not for profit organization. We stand here unified today right here in front of Chuck's uh, gun shop here in Riverdale, Illinois. Now, this is no reflection on the city of Riverdale because this is a real nice city to live in. But we're out here today because there's been a direct trace uh, to a lot of guns that have been used in Chicago in violent crimes to Chuck's gun shop. So that's why we stand there unified today. We're not against the Second Amendment. You know, I support concealed carry, so I don't want nobody to think anything different. But at the same time, the, the owners of Chuck's gun shop should uh, make sure that they abide by the law to the highest level to make sure them guns do not end up in the wrong people's hands. And that's why we're out here today. So that's my main message. And I'm out here with Pastor Greer supporting one of my colleagues as well. So from the point of just uh, civil rights or human rights, there's been a lot of questions. We are out here for the precious value of human life, nothing else. Our lobby has any lobby, not just our lobby, has to be about supporting lives and saving lives. The NRA, the Illinois Rifle Association, and other groups, affiliated groups, saying that they're doing the same thing, but we question that. We want to, we are open to dialogue, we're not excluding anybody's right to bear arms. 
We want to make sure that our communities are represented, that the civil rights and the human rights of our people are stood for. And that starts with the dialogue, that starts with talking about the history of the National Rifle Association up to date. And do you really protect oppressed minorities, black minorities, and minorities who really don't really understand or may not have the leverage needed when it comes to the gun lobby? So, that's the question. We're open for a debate with anybody about the gun lobby anywhere, anytime. We're not running. We're open. We're not diminishing anybody's role in this because we believe in order to have a true dialogue, everybody needs to come to the table. So, so we're not excluding anybody. Today we're beginning our press conference. Our press conference is here. Not number one. Number one, that we need a collective dialogue about gun rights and the gun control lobby laws in our country, in our community, more specifically in Chicago. I speak for my organization and a group of us who believe that the gun lobby has held civil rights in the poor community, the young black community, hostage. Illinois Governor Bruce Rauner is in the area one day after the legislature ended its spring session without a budget for the next fiscal year. Governor Rauner visited the Alton Mental Health Center earlier this morning. He's calling on people here to reach out to Democrats to pass two bills he supports. Right now, there is no plan to fund schools, and the governor is blaming Democratic legislators for putting Illinois where it is. Can we get a budget passed, Governor? Good morning, everyone. Just in the brief in the short, we are Greg Greer, Pastor Greg Greer, President of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference Chicago, Freedom First International. Standing with the advocacy and the movement here to send a clear message that the governor is a plurocrat. A government for the wealthy, by the wealthy, is what he represents. The communication has been elitist, has been top end education has been put on the back burner housing assistance has been been put on the back burner community economic development has been put on the back burner we're standing to show that that's not acceptable right that's right, right. That's we're right. standing that's to show right. that we are tired of a plurocrat running our state government running our city you know governor romner has historically been the, one of the most challenged governors in the history of Illinois. This regime, since day one, since its, its very inception, has been a regime, an organization, his cabinet, not for the people, not of the people, but totally opposite of the people, his policies, have been oppressive. His policies have been outside of the public interest. Chicago is a, is a historically union city, but from day one, Governor Romner came in and he was pitted against the unions. From day one, Governor Romner has been in opposition of the teachers, the valuable teachers who are in our communities, raised the children and are there for the children. And this is a very delicate relationship because we need the teachers on the front lines. But Governor Romner has even gone so far as to say that our schools are prisons. Our schools are jails. Our schools are the catalyst and the front lines to educate the kids, to bring any problems that are in the community away from the households. The schools are the front line to help us, to bring resolution, to bring restore, restoration into the communities. And if we lose that, we don't have anything else. For, so an attack on the schools is an attack in the front against the community. Anytime you are a plurocrat, 
and about the wealthy, and not about the seniors, not about the children, not about the babies who are dying. We will stand against you. Shut it down. 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 So this is uh, Kofi with Black Lives Matter Chicago, and uh, once again we have a situation where. Unfortunately, we have some in the black community that support people that uh, don't have our best interests at heart. So, Rana needs to be convicted. Forget just putting out of office. This dude needs to go to jail. He's a known capitalist that has shut down uh, senior citizens' homes. Uh, he's done so much violence against our community, specifically against Chicago State University, and then just the black community in general. So at the end of the day, this dude need to be out of office. But the beautiful thing is, us black people are coming together. We're working around self-determination. So slowly but surely, we're gonna less, need less uh, intervention from the government because we're gonna be able to take care of ourselves under the spirit of Ubuntu, Ujama, and Ujima. Uh, so that's what we're about. We're about black liberation at the end of the day. We're about doing for ourselves. T.O. Howard have been out here once again, standing up for the people. Today, Governor Bruce Rauner was invited to the Liberation Christian Center over here on the south side of Chicago under the leadership of James, Bishop James E. Dukes. We're saying that Governor Rauner should not be allowed anywhere in the African American community under no circumstances should he be allowed in our community. We are going to push forward to recall Governor Rauner because it's been two years now without passing the state budget. Uh, the schools are really failing uh, in, the, in the area of funding. There's a lot of commotion out here, but it's a much needed commotion because this governor shouldn't even be governor. The only reason Governor Rauner ran for governor is because he had conquered the corporate arena and he became bored, so he decided to spend all his money to become governor. He's a fake governor. He should never be allowed in our community any day, on Sunday, any day. And we. And don't get me wrong, standing out here in front of the church, we don't like to do this all the time, but at the same time, we should not respect this governor because he's not respecting the people of Illinois. When he ran, he ran on a platform to, uh, in, in his words, he wants to straighten out, uh, either straighten out Springfield, whatever the case may be, but what he's doing is that he's straightening out Springfield on the backs of the working poor people here, and we're still struggling in the state. Violence is high, unemployment is high, a lot of issues are going on in this state. Kids are struggling and suffering out here, and these sellout pastors of Chicago really need to stop. All these sellout pastors, and uh, that's why we're standing out here in unity today, and uh, thank you very much. Governor, thank you. Thank you. I look forward to having a dialogue with you, the whole group, and solving problems together. We gotta get our schools open for more money. We got to get our social services funded at least until January. We've got bills introduced to do that. And what we've agreed we're going to do is every week or so we're going to meet with members of the community, leaders of the community, to talk about this. Why now? All right. together. So thank you for your time. Thanks. Can you fund it? Thank you. 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 Good evening. Chicago's top cop is out and there is new pressure on the mayor who fired him to follow him out the door. The political and emotional upheaval growing tonight from the videotape killing of a teenage suspect allegedly murdered by a Chicago policeman. But more than the tape itself of a 17 year old being shot 16 times, it is the city's battle to keep that video under wraps and the more than year-long delay in filing charges that has Mayor Rahm Emanuel in full damage control mode. On October 20th of 2014, Laquan was shot 16 times in 13 seconds by Officer Van Dyke, Jason Van Dyke. Uh, these 16 shots caused an uproar in Chicago and multiple protests a lot of us participated and even organized those protests officer van dyke is representative of police brutality if if we were to put a face a poster boy face on police brutality officer van dyke would probably be be in the top five listed there even in his history van dyke had had 20 complaints with no disciplinary since he had been an officer since 2001. At one point, there was even a factor detailing a $350,000 award to a Chicago man. 
another incident uh, that was fact was a, a cover up in a separate shooting to whereas he was uh, implicated in covering it up. But yet and still this officer remained on force and unfortunately and tragically took Laquan McDonald's life. 16 shots in the cover up and it's one of the reasons why we're fighting to this day. And it's one of the main reasons why for us, the Chicago way in our forefront, standing on the forefront of community justice has to be real. It has to be a reality because we know one Jason Van Dyke, but I can probably show you several hundred Jason Van Dykes that we don't know about and several other incidents, not just in Chicago, but on a, on a national level that police have shot innocent victims in the community. Anytime we have a funeral in the black community, it can be traced back to Rahm Emanuel. 16 shots and the cover up. We have not forgotten. There's blood on the mayor's hands. There's blood on the mayor's hands. He has closed 50 schools. He has systemic corruption with the Chicago School Board. We have not forgotten his epic failure of the black community. Every child that's black and brown that dies it, the blood is on the hands of the mayor. It can be retraced right back to him. The Chicago police do not get to be judge, jury, and executioner of our children. Rahm Emanuel has created an environment that allows our people to be hunted. Our children are dying. Laquan McDonald did not deserve to die. 16 shots and the cover up. We are the state the Rahm Emanuel. Yes. Rahm yes. Emanuel was involved yes. in a cover up, people, and everybody has not forgotten what Rahm Emanuel was involved in. Right. He's trying to make a lot of changes in the city of Chicago right now, but it's too late. Rahm Emanuel was involved in the code of silence here in Chicago, and no matter what changes he makes, it still doesn't give him an excuse to continue to be the mayor of Chicago. We're tired of Rahm Emanuel and politics as usual in Chicago. The city is bleeding poor and working class people every day, not just in the homicides and the shootings. I'm talking about the increase in taxes and everything that's going on with the Chicago public school system. We have issues in Chicago. It's time for Rahm Emanuel to resign. Are we all in agreement on that? Yes! yes. This guy was involved in a straight up cover up from the floor up and from back from the top back down. Why so many gangs and why motherfuckers gotta be strapped up, man? Everybody wanna know why Chicago got so many killers. Hey, niggas came up for fighting this and that, but hey, ain't, ain't no motherfucker fighting. Niggas motherfucker grabbing their straps. Niggas embarrassed to get that ass whooped. Facebook. That's all I can say. You know what I mean? Bitch. Hey, niggas grabbing their bangers, first of all. You know, they ain't even going for that shit no more. You know what I'm saying? Niggas don't want to. Hey, they can't take an L. Can't take a loss, so hey. They go run and get that bang, and motherfucker, hey, try to take your life. Hey, that's, they gonna take your hell. You know what I'm saying? But it is what it is. It's just real <laughs> shit, man. Some niggas do it for just for just to be sink dumbass shit. You know what I'm saying? I ain't gonna lie. It's a lot of motherfuckers, hey, locked up in the county for bodies. The niggas locked up for crack or hey, anything else. You feel me? But. Man, it's just a lot of little dumb motherfuckers want to be seen, shit like that, and they ain't even getting no damn money. So I be looking at they dumb ass ain't anyway, no like, what the money. fuck, your dumb ass sitting in this <laughs> motherfucker? And you didn't win a pop, nigga. And they ain't even money. get paid. Yeah, so motherfuckers up there, hey, hey. just be some dumb Believe ass. Believe it or not, nigga, it was you a nigga that would have paid you five thousand to go pop that nigga, and you did. And, and you wouldn't go do it for free. You know what I'm saying? What type of shit that is? You know what I mean? Niggas are getting for five thousand right now. Hey, but what? So you that's know, a, that's a then if a nigga put 5,000 on that nigga head, that nigga go rich body your ass, niggas doing it for free. Nigga. So what the fuck? This nigga, nigga might burn down your mama house. Stop you know playing. They coming to get that's you, boy. Man. But you know what I mean? But yeah, that's real man. shit though, man. But just a lot of dumb up us do it for 
Just to, hey, to get a name. The next thing you know, when they ass sitting in Cook County Jail, taking that 25 years, niggas be crying. I didn't even see niggas out there crying, sitting on themselves, hey. You know what I'm saying? Hey, 50 years, yeah, you ain't number 16, 17. But it is. It's cold out here. It ain't cold out here. Watch that cop. 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 Shit Coming down real, the block. Boy. Coming down the block. Jesus, don't get your shit Swiss cheese on the wrong block. For real, you never know what's going on. You know? Swiss cheese and hey, shit. Y'all come on through. Phone they stop it. Yeah, of course. That's my. You see that? They gotta. They gotta you check their they surroundings before they, they continue. You know they got. They got to know. Gotta check your surroundings throat. before you continue. Come on home, man. Swiss cheese. Documentary says you see. You see my boy on point. Uh, I ain't gonna mark y'all look right here. Hey, hey, hey. Mark y'all kill, your granddaddy called. Mark y'all kill. Hey. Tell me about the gangs in Chicago. Shit, our gangs, you mean the cliques? Look. Shit, that's all it really is. Shit, making the hey, own clicks, you see, man. Hey, it's really shit. clicks, man. These motherfuckers ain't got well, behind you. Hang, hey, you see this little hang, shit, man. That shit on, on the entertainment shit, that shit be all them little rappers and shit, man. That's what it is, man. That's what they switching up to be, man. Clicks. This shit kind of crazy because this shit like rap groups, man. This shit kind of crazy. Hey, hey, hey whatever your rappers say, go do it. Hey, whatever your rappers say, go do it. You know what I'm saying? Hey, it's real crazy because that shit be real life. Motherfuckers say that shit in the rap and shit, but that shit be real life. It's real life going on out here. Look, bro, we just nice. hey, lost him. You know what I'm saying? March 18th, you know, birthday was March the 10th. This is why we got to keep a gun right here. You know what I'm saying? This type of shit. Streets motherfucker be violent, man. You got the five motherfucking nigga down, you know, hey. Motherfuckers just look at you wrong sometime and you, and you have to be prepared, hey. Better be on your ten toes, that's all I can really say, you know what I'm saying? Hey, but we ain't trying to lose no more, and that's on real shit, no I'm mercy. Ready. I'm Raymond Richard, born and raised in Cabrini Green on the north side, 20 plus years. I joined the gang at the age of 11. By the time I was 14, I was in juvenile detention. By the time I was 17, I was in Cook County Jail. By the time I was 21, I was facing 10 years in the penitentiary. Since then, my life has spiraled out of control. I got joined with the Black Gangster Disciples. And the first meeting was initiation. And then, of course, you know, back in the day, you had to prove yourself. That means you had to go on a hit. So what I had to do was I had to prove myself worthy. Whether it was to jump on somebody, shoot somebody, or stab somebody, I had to do that in order this initiation to show your loyalty. So that's what I did when I first got in. I had I proved my loyalty. This is Dead Man Field, where we all gang banged at. Many lives were lost here. I was shot here. I was stabbed. I was beat up. We had many big gang fights with the MCs and the vice lords. Um, so many lives was lost here. People were scared to even come across this field because of what it was called and what it was meant. And there's so much bloodshed. There's so many lives and so many spirits right here on this field that uh, even today I can, I can feel the spirits coming from here because I was once almost a victim of the dead man field because right there they put a, put a, bullet, a gun to my head and pulled the trigger, but it didn't go off. And that's the only reason why I'm here today. So this is what I'm talking about when I say this is the real deal. And so, uh, children died, elders died, innocent people died. They, for all what we thought was some turf that belonged to us, but in the end, Dead Man Field consumed so many lives that it was just, man, you can just cry, man. I, I can still see some of the brothers that used to walk this field, man. I can see their spirits, man, every time I come this way. So this is what it is. This is Dead Man Field in Cabrini Green. This was the deadliest field right over here in Cabrini Green on the near north side. So anybody came through here, they prayed, they were scared, they was afraid. And 77% uh, of the people didn't make it out, 30% did. This where all most of the dope dealers hung out at, right on this strip right here. And we would come out and everybody would have their little spots and what they were selling. We had trap spots down here as well where we always kept our stuff and we did our thing. Right here was where uh, a lot of stuff took place, right here on Cleveland. 
where all the fights kicked off, a lot of shooting kicked off. Uh, just up the hill where we just was, uh, my good brother uh, from the castle, his name was Robert Gallon, AKA Do Rob. He was killed up there um, on a Sunday morning. Um, down here is where everything took place at. This is where the, uh, it wasn't no gang banging down here because this was all GDs down here. It wasn't number GDs down here. And up here, as we walk up here, and this is where all the dope dealing, and gang banging and stuff took place. So it was, uh, not only was it home to us, but it also where a lot of us lost our lives is where a lot of brothers got killed at for uh, senseless violence as we know it as today because of uh, differences that couldn't be solved man to man. So they used guns in order to speak for their actions and they didn't fight because it was, it's a new day, it's a new generation. And by the time I was 21, I was facing um, 10 years for attempt murder where in an a, gang, uh, a gang fight we erupted and we started shooting at each other and one of the uh, opposing uh, gang members was shot in the back and of course they accused me of doing that. So they arrested me for attempt murder where I sat in the county for almost two years fighting that case. So the lifestyle as everybody perceived to be, that's not it. They glorify it and make it look good but it's not because I can remember my mother not even want to go to the store with me. My family didn't want me around because they didn't want whoever was coming after me to affect them. So I used to have to stay away from my family. I miss picnics, I miss barbecues, I miss uh, family reunions and all those things just because I joined the game. Look at how people are feeling. Look at the transformation that's happening. What we're doing right now in this moment, in this very moment in this community, is we changing the narrative. Look at all this people. Look at how these people are feeling rejuvenated, coming out of these businesses, coming out of their apartments, shouting black love, black power, black unity. Black cry. That's what it's all about. We gotta change the narrative. We gotta start speaking life in our people. We gotta quit saying that we ain't shit. We are. We are a mighty race. We are a mighty people. We ain't niggas. We kings. We queens. Change the narrative. Change the way you think about yourself. Change the way you see your brother and your sister. Then when shit happens to them in the community, you'll get active. You'll get involved because you won't look at them like they're a piece of shit and say that they're a nigga. You will look at them and say, that's my brother, that's my sister. They hurt me, I hurt me. That's what we got to get back to. We got to become the village again. We have got to stop this individualistic bullshit. That is not the way African people are. That's not who we are. We're better than that. We are a mighty race. All power to the motherfucking people. You gotta change it, black man. You gotta get out here and make a change in your community. Cause ain't nobody gonna come do it for you. These your kids, these your, your family members up in here. Stop the violence! Stop the violence! Stop the violence! Stop the violence! about people out on the street being unafraid and rising up and standing up so our children don't have to be afraid. No child should be afraid to be on his porch, to play out in the yard, to sit out on the front
part, you play it the part, and it's not going to change until we change it. Everybody, take care of your house, take care of your block, and then block by block, we'll take care of the city, and the children will laugh and play again. 2017, there's been over 1,100 shootings in the city of Chicago. We want to live! They say if we don't go to the NBA and go to the NFL, we're going to end up in a vicious cycle. We want to live! They say by the age of 21, we're going to end up dead or in jail. We want to live! We want to what? We want to live! We want to what? We want to live! Our kids count. One, two, three!